Hello. Oh, I like the intro music. That was Foo Fighters. Was that right? you? Yeah, that, that was me. Yeah, that's that was my little side gig to... doing piano to... elevator music for City Lab. Um, Dave. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. I don't um, do this very often. We we don't do this very often. I so so I'm flattered. We're we're all good. Um, so I just want to I, I have to say at the um, at the outset, um, in the interest of full disclosure, that um, I I consider Dave Grohl to be at least in the um, non senior citizen division um, the greatest living rock star. So this is this is going yeah. great. That's where you applaud. The under 70, the under We're 70. off to a good start. Yeah, the, the under 70 division, because a certain somebody just turned 70, as you know, Springsteen just turned 70. Oh, so yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah, and he's still going. Wow, um, that's terrible. But, um, so my, my <laughs> but he looks good. I, I, I pray that I look like Bruce, well, I've always prayed he, that I look like Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he, he looks great. He looks and um, so the point is, is that this is not going to be, and I'm just saying this in the interest of journalistic full disclosure, not going to be the hardest hitting interview in the history of the world. Uh, this is not like Mike Pompeo in Ukraine or something. Yeah. Although if you want to answer questions about Ukraine. Just don't make me cry. No, no. That's right. um, so, so we're going to talk um, along the theme of, of, of this conference. But those of you who don't know um, Dave Grohl, actually one of, the, one of the reasons that Dave is here here is that he did a wonderful eight-part uh, series for HBO called Sonic Highways. Um, and we'll talk about it in a, in a minute. But before we get to that, I, I just maybe we can uh, talk a little about your, your early days here in this very city. Um, I first knew a little bit about Dave Grohl when he was in a band called Scream, which was like 35 years ago. It was the, the mid 80s. It was the mid 80s. Um, but but my full consciousness of Dave Grohl happened when a lot of people got full consciousness of Dave Grohl during the Nirvana period. Um, and then, of course, um, immense long term success with Foo Fighters. Um, but let's talk about DC. Uh, and, and talk about how this particular area shaped your musical development. Well, one of the great things about uh, Washington, D.C. is, first of all, there's a lot of musical diversity, right? So from, uh, from the different neighborhoods that sort of represent different culture to, um, to the d different styles and genres of music you had everything you know there was a there was there was kind of a southern rock influence um you had bands like remember the road ducks okay yeah you don't know that. but there was it, you have to say it that a, way yeah you do that's oh, okay. how you pronounce it it's the road ducks um so but and then you had this really influential and important underground punk rock scene here and then you also had go-go music which is a specific type of funk that really is only in Washington D.C. Right. So there was there was something, and that and it was it was a small community of musicians that I think were all doing it just for the sake of playing music. So there was it really was a community, and that people would help and support each other. Right. I mean, both and very on, independent too. On both sides of that divide. I mean, actually, it's kind of almost a Rock Creek Park divide on the. West side of the park, there was Ian MacKay and Minor Threat, and on the east side of the park, there was Trouble Funk and Chuck D. That's but, right. Uh, actually, this is a good moment. If we can queue up, um, there's we have about a 30 second oh. clip from Sonic Highways. We can run that, the one on Washington D.C., and you can get a little sense of what we're Music. talking about. It takes a certain amount of willpower. Not only us, any band in this town. We was like recording this music, man. We was like putting out music like every other week. And the music was like spreading like a disease. The DIY thing carries through a lot of different music scenes in DC. And I'm sure you've experienced this, where you, where you run into some guy who's like a jazz guy or some funk player. You're from the punk scene and you guys relate in a way that's very Washington DC like language. I saw a real parallel with the go-go thing, but never could connect with them because it was a totally different world. And then we decided, like, we should play with Trouble Funk. They've headlined, we opened for them. Big Boys, Meyer Thread, Trouble Funk. Trouble Funk were interested in it, because they heard about the punk scene. We were into it, because we love the go-go thing. Then there's these punk funk shows. <laughs> yeah. They're both for, like, two underground type of sounds. 
and it just goes together. Yeah, I mean, it really did, you know, there was a DC sound. And that series, the Sonic Highway series, had a lot to do with how the environment, the atmosphere of the place that you're making music, how that influences the sound of the music. So we went to eight different cities and, you know, there was a time when everything wasn't so interconnected that, that places really did have a regional identity. And inevitably, that would sort of make its way into the music. And the music then sort of becomes the sound or the soundtrack to that city. So if you were to talk about, if you mention Chicago, music from Chicago, most people think, oh, blues. If you mention Nashville, most people think, oh, Grand Ole Opry. With Washington, D.C., it wasn't as mainstream as that, but the music, the punk rock music and the underground rock and roll, um, was it just sounded different than anywhere else. As with the go-go scene, which really was so regional that it barely made it to Baltimore. But that becomes a part of the city's identity that you're proud of, and also the ethics within that. So like the, the DIY thing that Ian Mackay was talking about, to me, that's like in my formative years as a musician, that's, that's how I learned to become a musician. I didn't go on The Voice and you know sing something once and start flying G4s all over the place. It started here in like basements and bars and learning how to uh, work within a community and doing things yourself. So that's, it's, it's actually how the Foo Fighters still work. I'm the president of our record company. And all I do is I, I make records and I license them to Sony BMG and um, nobody tells us what to do or how to do it and when to do it. And it and it's the reason why we've survived for 25 years, and I learned it from that guy here in Washington, D.C. when I was 15 years old. Talk, talk a little bit. Stay on Washington for a second. One of the interesting things about it um, is uh, look, it's historically been a racially divided city. Um, you're in, in this particular episode of Sonic Highways, you're, you're dealing very straight on with the fact that one type of music is developing on this side of the city, another type is developing on that. Mm -hmm. But there was overlap. There was a kind of joint appreciation that you didn't find in necessarily other sectors of society, especially around that time. T talk about it in the, in, the, in the context of race a little bit in this particular region. I've never felt like race made any difference with music at all. I honestly have never. I've been in bands with, uh, with African Americans. I've been in bands with people that grew up in Arlington, Virginia, in, beautiful, in big, beautiful houses. I've played in bands with people that grew up in Southwest and I don't, I, I honestly have, I feel like music and it sounds trite and it might seem silly, but I honestly believe it's the one thing that everyone can come together with. When I go out and play a Foo Fighters show and there's 50,000 people and they all sing a song like My Hero or Learn to Fly or something, when, when there's 50,000 people singing together in chorus, all of those lines just sort of disappear. And they might be singing those songs for 50,000 different reasons, but I get to bring them all together in that one moment, so it doesn't matter like what side of the aisle they're on or you know what church they go to, whatever it is. I honestly believe that, that music is the thing that can really bring people together. I wanna ask you a question about um, a club that was very, very important in your development, 930 Club, yeah. the original 930 Club. Yeah. Um, Talk about that, and this is an audience filled with mayors, filled with city planners. Um, everyone, I shouldn't say everyone wants to have a 930 club because there's also these noise issues and all the other issues that I think may- Rats, have, dude, they, they had big rats. rats. It was the original 930 big club. Rats. The original 930 club, you can get Ebola in the bathroom. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was like, it was, it was bad. It's pretty bad. Um, and, and, but, but talk about having that kind of place and what it does to help a, a musical ecosystem develop in a particular place? Well, I think that it's important. Um, I have three children. I have three daughters. But one of them is now 13 and becoming a musician. And she, of course, I help facilitate that, whether it's giving her some instruments to learn or a place to record into a microphone, whatever it is. Not every kid has that place to go or has that opportunity. I think that, I think that making 
making those things available to kids is very important for lots of reasons, but mostly because I think it makes them happy. And a community that, uh, that has a, um, a, a rich and um, exciting, vibrant music scene, I think that it brings, it brings a lot of happiness to the place that it, where it is. I've always felt like in America, you know, one of the, when we did the Sonic Highways TV thing, um, I felt like there wasn't enough music on television. When you travel the world, like if, you know, if you're awake at 11.30 at night in Italy and you turn on Ryuno, you're gonna see someone singing opera. You're gonna see some festival performance in a park somewhere. You're gonna, it's just sort of like more a, a, like a part of the general consciousness. Or, and I think that it, it sort of, it's, it's important, it's like air, it's important. You need to have that in your life just to remind you that you know, life's worth living. So somewhere like the 930 Club, it was a dump but it was important to generations of people that found inspiration in that crappy little room to go on and do the things that they you know, wound up doing in life. And I, I feel like you know, we, we had that club, but then we would also play in like art galleries and community centers and things like that. Um, but I do think that all of the places that you're from deserve to have some an opportunity like that for people to go to experience music, people to learn how to play music, for people to um, share music with each other and build a community. Because now, when I talk about Washington, D.C., I'm proud of being from Washington, D.C. When I say I'm a musician from Washington, D.C., people think like, wow, you're a badass. And I agree. Can I ask you? <laughs> Some people don't like Washington, D.C., by the way. I don't know if a lot of people of don't like America, Washington, D.C., but that's, a, sure. that's another subject. Yeah. Um, stay on this for one second before we go to, we drive across the country to Seattle. Yeah. Um, one, part of the, one part of this question or this mystery about why certain cities develop these vibrant music scenes is the, is the physical uh, ecosystem, the clubs. And, but another is, is, is the, the, the presence of certain geniuses, right? Uh, it, like in, in this case, it's like Ian Mackay, who fronted Minor Threat and then Fugazi. Um, and on the other hand, Chuck Brown, you know, basically. Without those two, we're talking about the musical forms that we're talking about associated with Washington, um, would this kind of ha thing happen? I mean, what, what, what's more important to it? Uh, the, the, the broad ecosystem or like just the, the serendipitous appearance of truly original musicians? Well, I, you have to have visionaries. You know, you have to have people that will think outside of the norm. So, you know, most people would think, oh God, I could never, I, won't, I can't start a band. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not an accomplished musician and I know nothing about the music industry. And so none of us did. And so when we, when we st started playing and writing songs and recording and making records when we were young, we didn't know what we were doing. So there was no right or wrong. We were just doing it the way we imagined it should be done. And in doing that, um, you're, you, you do things differently. And I think that leads to change. So then, or progress. So you're doing things outside of the norm or the way people normally do them. Um, no, I think there's, there are thousands of musicians in this city right now that could go on to change the course of popular music or whatever it is they do. They just need the opportunity to do it. And they need for someone to tell them like, oh no, it's, that's available to you and you're entirely capable of doing it. You know, you have to, be, it's one of the things, being a parent is one of the things that I tell my kids. I, when I was young, I, I thought I could do anything. I honestly, I felt, except to go to college, I thought I could do <laughs> pretty much anything. I thought, I, if I just put my mind to it, I'm gonna figure out, I'm just gonna figure it out and I'm gonna do it. I still feel that way. I don't know, I'm not a t director. I don't know how to make TV shows, but I did a fucking HBO series. <laughs> and so it's funny, it's, I, I honestly, and I, and I think that we did something that, that, that people haven't, hadn't done yet, and, um, and I'm very proud of that. But I'm also proud, you know, when, when I was asked to come here to, uh, to talk today, they said, what are, you, what are you talking about? I said, I haven't the slightest idea. And they said, really, what, how come they called you? I'm like, I have no clue. And that's kind of how I float through life. <laughs> <laughs> Kids, stay in school, don't do drugs. <laughs>
Is the, is, the, is the actual answer don't do drugs or just do the right amount of drugs? No, don't do the drugs. All right. You can't, right, no, right, I'm right, not saying right. that. He's, don't he's do the drugs. Front of, there might no be drugs. law enforcement Yo, this here. This is live streaming or something. The, uh, let's, go, let's go out to Seattle. And before you address Seattle, there's <laughs> one, more, one more clip that we should show uh, from Sonic High was about Seattle. I think a lot of bands would skip Seattle because it was just too far of a drive. If you're in a band, you're traveling around in a van, and you know, the kind of information traveled the way it did at that time. Are you really gonna drive 900 miles from California to play a show to five people in Seattle? Nowadays, everything's interconnected so much that all you have to do is pick up your laptop and see what's going on Tuesday night at that tiny club in Portland, Maine. When I was young, as a touring musician, it was a crapshoot. You never knew if the promoter had put flyers on the street. You never knew if the college radio station was playing your band's music. You'd show up to a club and cross your fingers that people would come to the gig so that you could get gas money to go to the next city. From Minneapolis to Seattle is 2,000 miles. Good luck on getting any shows in Spokane or anything. Forget it, you know. I got the real sense as a kid that you know, the scene in Seattle created itself because nobody else wanted to come up and entertain Seattleites, you know? I mean, people had to kind of start their own bands and their own scene because that was the only way live music was gonna get played here. Because nobody was gonna make any money, the scene was a network of hobbyists who were just playing for their friends. And when you're playing music as a hobby, you take more risks. And from that attitude, uh, a lot of these bands kind of created their own style. So you try out to be the drummer of Nirvana. You, yeah. get the, you get the gig. You go to Seattle. What do you find when you go to Seattle? What shocked you the most about the music scene compared to what you knew? Well, the isolation. First of all, the rain. You know, a part of that conversation that we were just watching had to do with the isolation and that um, Seattle kind of lived in its own funny little cultural biodome for the longest time, you know. They just figured, well, nobody cares. We're so far away and what do we have, you know, fish and Bill Gates or whatever that, you know, that we'll just sort of do our own thing. Um, so when I got there, you know what? The first, when I first got there, I hadn't joined Nirvana yet, but I went to go see them play. And so you have to understand, at the time, if you were an underground band and 500 people came to see your band, you were considered huge, right? Um, I went to this Nirvana show at this warehouse and there were a thousand people. And they were just on an independent label in town. But what I noticed was, was the identity, that the audience, they weren't like spiked hair and, and chains and, and leather jackets. They, they were kids from, they looked like kids from trailer parks. They had like flannel shirts that they got at the Fred Meyer or the Salvation Army and they wore like Converse chucks and ripped up jeans and they just looked um, like derelicts, I don't know how to say it. But it was, it was not a punk rock scene, but it was a youth-driven, uh, I mean, it seemed almost like a movement, and whatever it was about the music, uh, the sound, or the lyric, these people were connecting to what was going on. These kids were connecting to what was going on in a way that doesn't happen often. It happens just before a musical revolution, and that's what was happening. So I remember that, but, um, but again, coming from Washington, D.C., you know what? When I came to Seattle, you know what everyone's, I said I was from Washington, D.C., all they did was grill me on all the bands that I'd seen. Did you get to see Rites of Spring? I'm like, yeah. Oh my God, did you get to see Marginal Man? I'm like, yeah. Like, so that, I mean, to me, that meant like, coming from Washington, D.C., again, they were like, wow, that guy's from DC. So, um, but, you know, at the time, the city hadn't turned into the Seattle that it eventually became. And it all happened really quickly. So all of, there were four or five bands that blew up uh, really quickly you know, in a matter of months. And then it became the Seattle that, you know, designers started selling flannel shirts for $800 and 
it, it changed. But, um, but what I did notice is that it was the same sort of community that we had here in DC. And I think, you know, when, when Bruce Pavitt, the guy that ran Sub Pop Records, when he talks about like the hobbyist versus the careerist, um, that says a lot because I think that most of the people that started playing music in these cities didn't necessarily aspire to be the next biggest rock star in the world. They just, like, they had to do something other than, you know, I worked at Marlowe's Furniture Warehouse, and so I would shove trucks full of, like, sleeper couches all day long. I could not wait to play my instrument at the end of the day, not because I wanted to be a gigantic rock star, I just needed to beat the crap out of something because I was so sick of working at Marlowe's Furniture Warehouse. And I think that most musicians, like if it really comes from like the deep down place, um, then that kind of thing doesn't really matter. I want to thank our underwriter, Marlowe's Furniture Warehouse, for... Uh, I think it's still there. It is still there. It is, it's right? It's absolutely still there. Well, it used to be the largest furniture showroom in the D.C. metropolitan area. <laughs> I remember right. that. Um, answer this question, because, uh, you know, Springsteen, I don't mean to keep bringing him up. What's up with your obsession but, with Bruce Springsteen? Uh, sorry, Bruce Springsteen couldn't make it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jeez, Jeff. Just next little year, old me. Year, yeah, no, 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 little old me. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I've been to like 10 Foo Fighters shows, but like, sorry, 80 Springsteen shows, so I apologize in advance. But so have you, probably. No, 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 okay. I love Foo Fighters. I, yeah, I, yeah, I love The Atlantic, too. It's yeah. my favorite. <laughs> I, I, I got to go to Marlowe's. I, I got to go to Marlowe's and buy a closet and hide in yeah. So, so... So the aforementioned uh, rock star from New Jersey once um, once said that the, 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 the thing about the sound that he developed in the 70s and 80s is that Asbury Park was isolated, even from New York. It's only an hour drive, but it's still isolated. They didn't know what they were making, so they just made music that they thought they could make. Before, you know, before Springsteen, Asbury Park was not Asbury Park, right? right? Um, and, and so I think, you know, in listening to what you're, ta what, what you're talking about here with Seattle, um, the isolation be allows you to just experiment without too much homogenization, too much outside influence in a kind of way. And so the question is, are we losing something now? Um, you, you pick eight very specific and very, very different cities for your series. And so the, the, the question is, um, is technology, is the internet? You can go on YouTube right now and watch any band in a live performance anywhere in the, in the world, um, what are we losing by having that kind of ubiquity? Human interaction, which is important. Um, I think that as, I think it's, I, just as we talked about community, I think that um, it's one thing to see an artist or a song in a one dimensional, way. But what's really inspiring is when you see an actual human being on stage with an, with an instrument made of wooden wires and one microphone do something so moving that it, it conjures emotion and you, you fall into like a romantic state of loving life because people do great things. I have, again, my daughters, it's one thing when they watch this stuff on their phones or YouTube all day long. But when I take them to go see an artist on stage, it's, it's, it's so different. So yes, I do think that it's different in that there isn't so much isolation now um, that you're influenced by so many more things, but the community and the interaction between people is, is what's most important, whether it's watching a band or just sort of being a part of a community. Like, that's where great things happen. Do you worry about the creative process when everybody is influenced no. by everything? No. No. I have faith in people's uh, imagination and passion for doing things. Like, we're not done. You know, music's not done. I have one more question about that, and then a final question about cities. But talk about the state of rock 
if you will, and and the guitar band, the guitar based band. Yeah. And I say things to my own kids like, you know, there's this thing called guitars, and you could listen to them, and they're really exciting, yeah. and they and they don't. It's not where their their heads are at. Talk about the state of of rock and roll as we understand it. Rock it's like and an roll. essay question. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's one that I I answer a lot because. Um, there are plenty of rock and roll bands. Um, none of them are as good as Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> why do you why do you um why do you hate Springsteen so much? I love Bruce Springsteen. Why do you love him so much? Why, why do you love him more than me? I, I I can have I you know I can have love for I contain multitude. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I think that it's still there. Um, you know, when we go on tour, we play these gigantic shows to thousands of people that are singing every word and it's exciting and it's super fun. So it's hard for me, it's almost hard for me to comment on it because from where I'm standing, it's just great, you know? <laughs> like, and people, people love guitars, you know? People love, I mean, these days when we get up on stage, um, you know, there's, there, it's so loud and I'm screaming so hard for three hours and we've, we're going on like right after a guy with a turntable and a microphone. And it's just, I think there's something really exciting about musicians that go out and kind of leave it all on stage. You know, the imperfection of that human performance of just like, ah, you know, that's rock and roll. And it's absolutely still there. It's not at the forefront of the music industry. But listen, you know, if you, if, if, Again, my kids, I'm looking at my daughter who's picking up instruments and learning them like one a week. She's going for it. She's got a beautiful voice. She's a great singer. And all she wants to do is like grab a guitar and write a song and perform it for other people. And she's 13. So um, it's only a matter of time. You know, these things are cyclical too. Like it's only a matter of time before the guitar becomes cool again. Um, so I, you know, and I have faith in the next generation of of kids that are going to come out and do things that we just can't even imagine. Right. So it's still uh, there. Since we have this audience of people who think a lot about cities and how to make them culturally vibrant, um, do you have any advice for people who are trying to create places where kids can yeah. spontaneously create the kind of music that makes their cities vibrant and exciting? All ages venues, that's a big deal. You know, that was one of the things in Washington, D.C. There weren't too many all ages venues, so we had to make them or find them. And I'm, um, you know, that's, and I learned to play drums by listening to the records of the bands I was going to see. So that, so I was inspired and influenced by the bands that I got to see when I was 14 years old or 15 years old. And had I had to wait until I was 18 or 21, I might have missed that golden hour window of, uh, opportunity, which there is, by the way, every kid in between the ages of 10 and 13, every musician that you've ever seen or heard on the radio, it's in between the ages of 10 and 13 that those kids decide this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. It's very, it's really specific. It's not often that you know you, you're 25 years old decide to leave it all behind for a rock band. It happens when you're 10 <laughs> or 13 years old. But all ages venues is I think that's very important to sort of like, to grow and foster a community of younger musicians that will end up, I mean, wouldn't you love it if your city was famous for music? Like people, it'd be so amazing, right? Like when you think of New Orleans, you like, it's, you know, it's New Orleans, man. You know, New Orleans is famous for jazz, man. And that's like, if every city, and actually I, we, we did New Orleans, we did an episode on the Sonic Highways thing too. We were there for a, a week, right? Every day I was walking in a parade with a drink in my hand and like, you know, there's 500 people walking down the street with a, with a second line band and, you know, parades would just happen like wildfires in Los Angeles. It'd be like, where the fuck did that come from? Like, it would just happen like that. And so, um, but it was allowed. And you could see what that would do to the city. You could see like the joy. It didn't, no matter what was going on in your day, if you heard a second line marching down the street, you're just like, oh, that's so beautiful. If every city would allow that, it sounds crazy and unreasonable, but why not? Like, why, why not just let music be? Let it, let it walk down the street when it's time to walk down the street. Or let a kid who's 14-year-old 
14 year old kid walk into a bar and watch maybe not a bar watch watch you know an in, a, a musician that's going to influence them to go on with their lives and do great things i do think that um you have to give the younger generation more credit i think they deserve more credit and i think they need a place to be able to be free to play music um and parades every day parades every day so <laughs> so um Dave, let me just let me just say in in closing, um, for those of you who don't listen to Foo Fighters, it's a great experience to listen to. I, he's a great almost as good as Bruce Springsteen. No, 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 no. I was gonna say I was about to say something nice about you. Jeez, oh, wow. I get uncomfortable when that. Yeah, happens. I know, I know. Praise and criticism, right? <laughs> um, the uh, but but I mean, he's he's a remarkable ambassador for for rock, for for music, for this particular region, for Seattle. Um, <laughs> But all, but it really, for it just this is sort of a private view, but it, it's it's ultimately comes down to the songs that you make and the shows that you put on. We were talking before about a Foo Fighters show I saw once at George Mason years ago, where the power went out, but they kept playing anyway because that's what we in the audience were demanding. And he was 100 percent, 150 percent into it. It was kind of a remarkable, memorable show that wasn't supposed to go that way, but that was made it memorable. I got uh, bills to pay, okay. So if I didn't finish that show, <laughs> the um, and I and I will say this about the music. Um, I I often start my day in the car by listening to the first minute or two of Enough Space just to get me going. Wow. Yeah, just to get me going. I follow it with Rosalita by Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, <laughs> but then I come back to learn to fly, so it's all good. Could you join me in thanking the great Dave Grohl for joining <laughs> yes. us today? Thank you very much. <laughs>